Regeringsleiders van de CARICOM hebben in hun openingstoespraken van de 33e tussentijdse staatshoofdenvergadering sterk de nadruk gelegd op regionale verbondenheid. Zij wezen niet alleen op het belang van deze meeting, maar stonden vooral stil bij de regionale handel, de veerkracht van de regio gedurende de COVID-19 pandemie en het beleid gericht op telecommunicatie en ICT. Other heads of delegations, heads of regional and international institutions, representatives of civil society, delegates, it is my pleasure to welcome you all and to address this opening session of the 33rd intersessional meeting of the heads of government of the Caribbean community. I am particularly pleased that this, my first address to this forum as Secretary General, is taking place in my home country. I thank the government and people of Belize for the hard work that has ensured that this meeting takes place despite the ongoing effects of the COVID pandemic. We must all be reminded of the necessity to follow protocols to ensure that our stay in San Pedro is a safe one as we conduct the business of the community in this beautiful setting. Let me welcome to the chairmanship of the Conference of Heads of Government for the first time our host, the Prime Minister of Belize, Honorable John Brasenio. I have no doubt that his experience and skills will be of great benefit as he leads our community in this uncertain time. I must thank the Prime Minister of Antigua and Barbuda, the Honorable Gaston Brown, for his stewardship as chair of the community during a very testing time in the last six months of 2021. Thank you, Prime Minister. A warm welcome is also extended to the Prime Minister of the Bahamas, the Honorable Philip Davis, who is coming to his first meeting as the member of the Conference of Heads of Government. Prime Minister, we look forward to the new perspectives and insights that you will no doubt bring to the discussions. Chair, Heads of Government, distinguished delegates, we gather together around the table rather than virtually for the first time in almost two years. The circumstances that occasion that hiatus are still with us. We are learning to live with it and to conduct our affairs in what can only be described as the new normal. This we have to abide by in coming to grips with repairing the health, social and economic devastation of the COVID-19 pandemic. Once again, a disaster not of our own making has befallen us. Significant obstacles still lay in our path. Much too many of our citizens remain unvaccinated. Too many of our children are still out of school. Too many of our businesses are still floundering with the resultant effect on unemployment. However, one thing we have learned over the 49 years of our existence is that we are a resilient community, bound together, particularly in times of adversity. Such is this time. Just as the skills of the Caribbean Public Health Agency have guided us through the pandemic, the operations of the Caribbean Disaster Emergency Management Agency have been crucial in times of natural disaster and the structures of the CARICOM Implementation Agency for Crime and Security and the RSS have, kept, have helped to keep us safe from external security threats, we have in place the tools that we can use to build back better from the social and economic damages of the pandemic. We must now move forward that trust with the trust and confidence we have in those institutions into those measures that make the CARICOM single market and economy work for all of us. Let us set a target to lift intra-regional trade out of the doldrums of 16 to 18% of our total trade into 25% by 2025. Chair, heads of government, distinguished delegates, as we look towards a major milestone in 2023 of 50 years of CARICOM, we can celebrate our achievements across the four pillars of our integration movement. What we must also do is look forward to those achievements as the foundation for building a resilient Caribbean community 
based on rule of law, participatory governance, social and economic and environmental resilience, in short, a place in which our people live in a safe, viable, and prosperous society. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, a warm welcome to Belize. I am especially happy to welcome you all to San Pedro and Burgesqui, better known as La Isla Bonita. San Pedro is a destination which attracts many foreign and local tourists. It epitomizes beauty and leisure, which unfortunately many of us will not get to fully enjoy this week. But San Pedro is truly a microcosm of the challenges we all are facing as small island and low-lying coastal developing states. Beaches here are eroding because of rising sea levels. The Belize Barrier Reef, a World Heritage Site, is struggling due to coral bleaching. A growing population is testing the limits of the island's capacity. More recently, the COVID-19 pandemic dealt a devastating blow to San Pedro's lucrative tourism industry. But the resilient people of San Pedro did not succumb. They did not give up. When tourism ebbed, they pivoted to fishing. Pioneering coral transplantation is restoring the reef, and a Herculean beach reclamation project is underway. Yes, we are adapting and mitigating. We are spending millions to meet these crises because we must, even though we did little to cost them. Unfair, yes. The harsh reality of the 21st century prime ministers, ladies and gentlemen, this 33rd intercessional meeting is a particular consequential meeting. We meet at a time when unprecedented and existential challenges coincides with our citizens' expectations for relief and prosperity. The international climate is riddled with crises, conflicts, and suffering. Every country, every region is managing, they say, unprecedented challenges with, they say, inadequate sources. The global unraveling is occurring against the backdrop of what appears to be a new Cold War. As we meet, Russia has invaded Ukraine. This is a flagrant violation of international law. We condemn it in the strongest terms, this unjustified invasion. There must be an immediate cessation of hostilities and immediate and unilateral withdrawal of all Russian troops from Ukraine. We call for all to respect their obligations under international humanitarian law. The uncertainties that exist are proof positive that multilateral cooperation and support are indispensable to effectively countering the immense challenges we face. At the same time, at national and regional levels, we bear the responsibility of meeting the aspirations of our people for development, for improved standards of living, and for opportunities. This is our primary duty, our enduring mission. Across CARICOM, we are contending with the worst economic recession in modern history. In 2020, our country saw double-digit economic construction. Thousands of our citizens were suddenly unemployed. Remittances dried up. In Belize, we estimate that the poverty rate has increased from 50% in 2018 to 60% by 2021. Two thirds of all Belizeans are poor. This is clearly unacceptable. No doubt, similar circumstances obtain across the region. The robust economic recovery that appeared to be at hand in the first part of 2021 is now slowing. In August 2021, ECLAC projected 
that the Caribbean would grow by 4.1% in 2021. By January 2022, ECLAC revised its projection to 3% and a measly 1.2%, excluding Guyana. For 2022, ECLAC has already revised downward its projections for the Caribbean from 7.8% to 6.1%. To to In addition to these circumstances, many of us are carrying unsustainable debt loads and have limited fiscal space to mount the necessary economic response. Unfortunately, only four CARICOM member states are participating in the IMF's Debt Service Suspension Initiative. And in 2020, only five member states, including Haiti, received concessional financing from the World Bank. This is wrong. It is also unjust. While it is imperative that we continue to press our case, which is fair and just, we know from experience that the wheels of international cooperation grind slowly. We cannot afford to lose for the ground. We cannot afford to lose our future. Therefore, we must be more strategic and coordinated in our advocacy. We must demand an immediate reform of the international financial system, demand urgent climate action, and immediate access to vaccines. I want to also thank the Secretariat for all their support in the preparation and conduct of this meeting. And I must thank um, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Belize, um, CEO Amalia Mai and her staff for putting all this together in such a short time. Let me also welcome those colleagues who are joining the conference for the first time, Prime Minister Davis of the Bahamas and Prime Minister Pierre of St. Lucia. Prime Ministers, ladies and gentlemen, we meet today at this place called San Pedro and Burgess Key, Belize. It was first settled by the majestic Mayas and became an important trading place for the Mayas. The Maya civilization was advanced, it flourished, and then mysteriously waned. Life forever is guaranteed to no one. The Commonwealth heads of government meetings in Rwanda and the summit of the Americas in Los Angeles, California, are both scheduled for June this year. COP27 is expected to be held in November in Egypt. These are signposts on the road we will travel. There are forks in the road. We will face radically divergent paths on each occasion. Like the Mayas, let us remember that choices have consequences. Nevertheless, as I look to the future of our region, I am hopeful, I am optimistic, I am confident. Like the good people of San Pedro, we will have to dive deeply into a reservoir of resilience, ingenuity, and creativity to elaborate our own path for development and prosperity with trust and faith in each other. I thank you. I welcome you to this opening ceremony, uh, which is a familiar one in governance of the Conference of Heads of the Government of the CARICOM Community CARICOM. After six months as chairman in office of CARICOM, I hand the gavel of leadership to my colleague and friend, the Prime Minister of Belize, John Vicino. In doing so, I offer him my full support, as I'm sure all my colleagues do. I do not offer my support lightly, or as a protocol gesture, because our unity and solidarity in CARICOM will be a vital and necessary element in the strength and stability of our organization as we face a world in flux. All around us, very dangerous and volatile changes threaten to overwhelm the international order as we have come to know it. As I speak, the guns of war are once again roaring in Europe in a military confrontation that could bring two nuclear-armed world powers into open conflict. The implications of this development for world peace and security 
are almost too frightening to contemplate. The trend towards danger and volatility across many spheres in international affairs has characterized the past six months of my chairmanship, and I fully expect it to continue. Approximately eight months ago, hardly had I assumed my responsibilities as chairman of CARICOM when we had the tragic news of the assassination of one of our colleagues, the president of um, Haiti, Juvenel Moise. This was an event almost unheard of in our region, but a tragic reminder that our region is not immune from the forces of instability and criminality swirling around the world. Barely had Haiti come to terms with the tragic loss of her president when she was struck by an earthquake, followed shortly by the passage of Tropical Storm Grace. In other parts of our community, Many of our member states struggled with the demands of the COVID-19 pandemic that called for the vaccination of a significant portion of our populations in order to achieve herd immunity. Obtaining adequate supplies of vaccines on the international market became an issue. And even with the help of CAFA, PAHO, and the establishment of the COVAX facility, several of our member states faced vaccine shortages. Vaccine hesitancy also emerged as a significant regional challenge. We remain grateful to those countries of the international community which stepped forward to fill the gap. And these include the United States and India. With resolute and joint action, I firmly believe that the worst of the COVID-19 pandemic is now behind us. And our community is emerging from the devastating effects of COVID on lives and livelihoods. Climate change remains the most significant existential threat facing all of humanity. The hopes of people in so many countries around the world for meaningful action in the climate emergency were dashed against the rocks of the obstinate and selfish attitudes of developed countries and large corporations assembled at the COP26 in Glasgow last November. As chairman of the Alliance of the Small Island of the Small Island States, Alliance of Small Island States, I had a distinction of leading the advocacy on behalf of small states as we strive to make the world aware of the existential threat posed to our region by the world's climate emergency. It is not a secret that the results of COP26 fell far short of expectations and we continue our advocacy to push the major polluters of the world to reduce emissions, to take mitigating actions and to contain rising temperatures to within 1.5 degrees of pre-industrial levels. Greater attention will also be focused on climate emergency accountability as we aggressively examine the legal recourses available to us under the appropriate international tribunal for loss and damage to end the injustices suffered as a result of the reckless actions of major polluters. I believe that CARICOM has learned from these developments to rely more and more on our own initiatives and our own resources to produce, buy, and consume local and regional products as a priority for increased product security, profitability, and sustainability. We have taken decisions as a community to give priority to agriculture and tourism in our COVID-19 recovery strategy, given the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on these sectors. It is a truism that no community of nations could be considered great if it cannot feed itself. Food and nutrition security is an achievable goal, and I look forward to the recommendations and the urgent implementation of the plan from the Ministerial Task Force, which is chaired by the distinguished president of Guyana. The nutrition element is vital as we battle against non-communicable diseases, which are rampant in our region and continue to deplete our human resources as a result of the effects of debilitating illnesses and premature deaths. As we produce and consume more regional products, we must commit to joint action to develop reliable logistics and sustainable transportation to move goods and people within the region. This necessitates <clears throat> increased commitment and joint action among member states to facilitate a fully functional integration movement. I commend the Secretary General and the CARICOM Secretariat as they seek to turn the mandates of the heads of government into meaningful and practical action and 
to address the many challenges that loom before us. In closing, I wish us all a successful meeting, hoping as always that CARICOM moves from strength to strength in the noble task of regional development and integration in which it is engaged. I'm obliged. Thank you.